Amen. Thank you, brother. The title of the message this afternoon is Letting Down Our Nets. Letting Down Our Nets. And so if you start there, verse 1 of our text, <clears throat> probably somewhat familiar with the story. It says, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, uh, which is the Dead Sea, and he saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into uh, one of the ships, which was Simon's or Peter's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. The Bible has a lot uh, to say about fishing, right? How many guys like, it's springtime now, I'm getting the itch, right, to go out fishing. Uh, Braden and I like to go out catfishing, stay up all night long, uh, which is what the fishermen did right here. They, they toiled all night, <laughs> stay all, all night long with the lines out there waiting for some big catfish to jump on there. Take them home, fry them up. I mean, that's some good stuff. And it's the time of year, man, camping, fishing, all that kind of stuff. And I love that the Bible has a lot to say uh, in regards to, I mean, he chose fishermen. If you read here, the uh, if you read some uh, background here, you find that all of these guys, Simon and his brother Andrew, and then if you check it out, they were partners with James and John, sons of Zebedee, all fishermen. Okay, that was their job. They uh, they 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 were they were fishermen. Okay, so here's Jesus coming out. He's he hasn't selected his disciples yet. And he comes onto this scene where all the people are following him, and it uses the word press there, which I don't know about you, but what I think about when I hear that word press is, is, is the press. The journalists, you know, that are pressing up on people, and they won't give them any space, and they're trying to, and all these guys are pressing up on Jesus, right? The, the large press is following him. So when he gets to the sea, now he already knew what he was going to do. I, I, I believe that. But when he gets to the sea, he sees these two ships there, and these fishermen that are standing out there cleaning their nets, no doubt, you know, knows who Jesus is, maybe listen to a little bit of his preaching, I don't know. But they're out there after a long night's labor, uh, fishing and all that. And, and you know, oftentimes uh, they, they did use hooks, you know, and the Bible talks about that a lot. Uh, angling, you know, they would go, they would, they would, just like we would use fishing. The poles didn't look exactly like ours. But most of the time they used nets where they would just cast, they're, they're, they're just cast nets. People still use those today. Uh, they cast the net out there and they've got little weights on the bottom that take it down, uh, down to the bottom of the sea. They wait, hope for enough fish to gather on that. They pull that net in and hope to grab some fish. And these are professional fishermen. They know how to do this, and they've been doing this a lot. They also know this, and if you're a fisherman, how many of you guys have, fi have fished here? Maybe you've taken your kids fishing. That's particularly who I'm, have you ever been fishing with a kid? Okay, what do you spend most of your time doing? <laughs> Lines tangled up, I'm snagged, right? Everything snags, because the bottom of the sea's got all these, you know, uh, plants and rocks and all that stuff to get uh, to, to just, you know, you pull up your line. I got something in this, just a big thing of seaweed hanging off of your, your hook, right? The inside, the sea is nasty. And so what they would have to do at the end of their job, I mean, the end of their day's work is they'd have to take these nets and they would have to clean them because otherwise it's going to stink up the boat. Otherwise, the, uh, the line that they use to make the net is going to deteriorate, and they want these to last a long time, and so they got to clean them all up, and they got to get all the seaweed, and they got to get all the, uh, the nasty stuff out of there, and then they have to wash that net. And then what they would do, other places you see where they're, it talks about they were mending their nets because inevitably they're going to get snagged. And when they pull that net in to hopefully bring in some fish, inevitably there's going to snag something. Or if they do catch fish, you know, sometimes they you know, snags the net that way. So then they would spend this great amount of time not only washing the uh, nets and getting all that stuff out of there, getting it all untangled and ready to go, but then they would also have to mend those nets. And I watched a video on people that was a... Uh, 
I don't know, like a third world type country or something that was making the video. Isn't that something third world countries now can make YouTube videos? But uh, they were showing how they mend their nets, and it was a pretty neat process. A lot of work involved in that to get the nets all done. Here's what I see. I see that they were working on this as Jesus is teaching the people and they're following him. And then he gets into, the, into Peter's uh, ship and he says, hey, take me out, cast me out there a little bit off the shore. And what he would do is, is then they wouldn't be able to, all those people wouldn't be able to throng up upon him, press up upon him. They would have to stand on the shore. He'd be able to go a little bit off into the water. The water would actually act somewhat as a, uh, an, a, a way to uh, be an acoustic, you know, uh, uh, it kind of amplifies the sound as he's talking and, and, and it would amplify so they can hear him better. These are the types of reasons he would have been out there. And so he tells Peter, of all people, hey, send me out there a little bit way off to the shore so I can speak to these people. I picture that Andrew... Uh, you know, if Peter's obviously in the boat, I don't know, but I'm just speculating here, but Andrew, James, John, probably still washing their nets, mending their nets the whole time Jesus is talking. And they've got these things, they try to get them all clean, they try to get them all ready. It's been a night, they've been working all night long, didn't catch a thing. Now, they're just ready, you got, got salt all over you, that's a, the Gennesaret right there is a, a salt sea. Okay, it's one of the only seas that, I mean, uh, lakes that is just salt water. And, uh, and it's got to be nasty, uh, just sweating all night long and just toiling. And they're just ready probably to go home, wash themselves as well, not just their nets, but wash themselves, get some rest. And, uh, but, but Peter says, okay, I'll go out. Let's Jesus talk. And when Jesus gets done talking, he says, uh, I want you to what cast your net out again there's three things i want to show you in this in this message here number one is the drought okay they says that they fished all they fished all night look at verse four now when they had, when he had left speaking he said unto simon launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought but it's not drought anybody know how that's pronounced it's draft. And if you don't trust me, Alexander Scorby, who seems to be our standard of the English language, says draft. <laughs> I used to always say, <laughs> I used to always say drought, and I noticed that when Brother Justin read it, he said drought too, but it's really draft. Okay, that's the old English way of saying that, according to Alexander Scorby. And so it's a draft. <laughs> But, uh, but that's not the drought I'm talking about. There is a drought, meaning he said, hey, we fished all night and we haven't caught anything. You see that in, uh, in verse 5. He says, uh, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And so we have number one is going to be the drought. The fact that, hey, we've been fishing all night. We haven't caught a thing. You ever feel like that in life? Like you're just in a time of drought, man. I'm not... You know, I'm, I'm not seeing the results here. I'm not seeing things happen. There's a time of drought, and then there's a time of doubt. Uh, you know, verse 5, he's like, I just don't know. Like, I'll do it anyway, but, hey, we, we've, been, we've been toiling all night. And then, finally, there is the, not drought, but draft, okay? So we got a drought, a doubt, and the draft. Incidentally, and I don't look into the reason why, but draft is also how you pronounce the word that's used for the toilet <laughs> in the Bible, you know, he says uh, it goes into the draft. Anyway, we don't want to go there. So <laughs> the drought, number one is the drought, okay? We have a calling as Christians, right? Obviously, you understand the parallel. He says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You understand he's going to say that later on. And this parallel is, hey, you are in the fishing industry. You are going after fish, but I'm going to make you a fisher for men. All right, I'm going to make you a fisher for men. That's what he does. He's, he's, he, these are his disciples. He's disciplining them. He's teaching them, showing them how to do this. He says, I'm going to make you to be fishers of men. So as Christians, we have a job to do, just like Simon, Andrew, James, and John. And, uh, and uh, let me see here. Uh, there is, they, this was their particular trade was fishing. And I'll pause there real briefly don't take the time to turn there, but in Acts 18, we see the Apostle Paul. Full-time ministry, right? I would say if anybody was full-time ministry, Paul's full-time ministry. And yet he actually had a trade 
on the side. He had a job which was tent making. Okay, And so really, I want to just pause to say this, that uh, even though our ministry is reaching people, our ministry is, you know, my number one priority, I know I'm the pastor, that makes it a little bit different, but my number one priority is to do the work of the Lord and to, you know, I'm just in full-time ministry. But really, everybody in here, thank the Lord, we've got all soul winners in here. And everybody in here is like, hey, my number one priority is to do the will of the Father as well. But on the side, you also have this trade. And sometimes people in full-time ministry, quote-unquote, also have a full-time job. And I remember whenever uh, I was at Steadfast in Oklahoma City, I preached on uh, the life of Aquila. And of course, he was a tent maker just like Paul. And so they worked together in the same craft. And, And so look... And he ended up, it seems to me like he was a, a pastor because he had the church that was in his house, okay, Priscilla and Aquila and the church that was in their house. And so they also work. And in, in this life, we have to realize, I've met a lot of people in the, in the ministry who it seems like they want to be in the ministry because they think, hey, I'll never have to work again. I'll have all my bills paid, <laughs> right? And I'm going to tell you what, the people that enter into the ministry with that mentality, they're not going to make it in the ministry, right? You cannot go into the ministry to have all your needs met and to have and, and just to make money because it just doesn't work that way. Okay, the guys that will make it in the ministry, God, who God's going to call and God's going to use, people who are willing to work hard, right? And if you have to have a full-time job and, and work in the ministry, man, that's how a lot of guys are going to start because God wants to bless that, that effort, okay? But these guys had a job which was, which was fishing, and, uh, and I don't think necessarily that they stopped fishing altogether. They probably still caught fish when they wanted to eat. They just left it as a trade, as their full-time business, working for their father or whatever it was. They left that as just a, uh, a full-time trade, and they did kind of something on the side. It's kind of like taking, a, taking another, job, uh, another job. But their full-time job was following Jesus, okay? And uh, we see that up until the end uh, when, uh, to the death of Christ, and then they kind of fell back unto that which they knew. You know, look at uh, John chapter 21. John 21. I've heard of a lot of guys who were preachers, and then they kind of quit the ministry because things got rough, and they went right back to whatever it is they used to do, right? Uh, I could easily say, well, I'm just going to go back to starting my own business. I'm going to go back to, you know, see if UPS is still hiring. I don't know. <laughs> we could just go back and fall, on, fall back on the things that we know. Some guys become car salesmen. Hey, uh, you know, go from a preacher to being a car salesman. That just seems kind of weird. Or insurance salesman. <laughs> but, uh, but sometimes they fall back on the things that they know when they leave the ministry. John 21, 3, Simon Peter, this is after Jesus uh, uh, resurrect, uh, rose from the dead. Uh, ascended back up to the Father, Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. They said unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered to a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Then an incident is going to happen that is pretty reminiscent of, the, of our text here in uh, Luke 5. And so this was their trade, uh, but Jesus said, Hey, I want you to follow me. And there's going to be times when we follow Jesus where we feel like, man, it's just not going the way I envisioned it. You know, I'd be better off going back into the secular world because, uh, you know, I'm speaking mostly from my, from my own perspective. I realize most of you guys are still have full-time jobs outside of this. But you say, man, I just, it's just not working, man. Things aren't happening the way I want it to happen. I'm not seeing results, and I just need to go back to the things where just give up on, on you know, those steps that I took towards following the Lord. I thought this was the will of God. And just I'm going to go back on it because nothing's happening the way I want it to happen. And if, I would even venture to say most of your life is going to feel that way. Most of your life is just waiting for those times of success, waiting for those blessings where you're just like, oh, that was just a wonderful thing. And then you spend there. Isn't fishing that way? You know, you, you all know, I, even pro- professional fishermen, they don't really go out and just catch fish all day long every day. Right now, some of them, they just know the hot spots or whatever. Yes. But for the most part, they're waiting for that time when they catch the fish. And then they say, hey, that was the greatest thing. I had such a great time. But then they might not go, they might go out the next time and not catch a thing. I heard somebody say that with golfing. 
they said, hey, everybody that starts playing golf hates it because they can't ever, they can't ever do it. But then they have that one hole where they have a successful putt or I don't know, a successful drive or something. <laughs> I'm not a golfer, but they do that. And then they say, man, that was so awesome. I think I can do that again. And they're waiting to, to, to do it again, to see results again. In our Christian life, a lot of times we're fishing and we're looking back to that time that we got, you know, five souls saved. And we're saying, I want that to happen again. And we're going out there fishing, nothing. Going out fishing, nothing. Going out fishing, nothing. Nobody's getting saved. Or I'm getting people saved. This is what I. This is what drives me crazy in the ministry. Get people saved. You're like, this is amazing. They said they wanted to come to church. They want to be discipled. You know, just this morning, a guy said, hey, I want to come out with you soul winning. And I said, praise the Lord. He said he'd even come out to Kansas City and, and, and go soul winning with us out here. And I said, praise the Lord. That's that guy that, uh, 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 Jeff, that I was talking to you about. And so I said, praise the Lord for that. And I'm thinking, you know, sometimes people get excited. They start telling you, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to do all this. And you think, this is great. And then two weeks goes by and they're gone. Right? They're not doing it anymore. And you're like, this is so frustrating. It's kind of like you're fishing and you're getting nibbles. The fish are biting, but you're not getting them in. Right? Sometimes you feel like that. And it's frustrating, right? You're in a drought. And this is kind of where uh, the disciples were over here. Jesus is trying to show them a lesson. But here's what the Bible says. It says in Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season ye shall reap if we, we shall reap if we faint not. Second Thessalonians 3:13 says, "But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Keep working. Keep doing the job, uh, the job that God has called you to do, even if you say, "Well, I'm just not seeing the results. Well, who cares? It's the right thing to do, so do it. And you just keep on going to keep on working, and you'd be like Peter, man, you think, well, how Peter, oh, a little faith. Well, he did say, okay, nevertheless, at your word, you know, we toiled all night long, didn't catch a thing. And you think just because if I just go out here and just cast my net back, I'm going to catch something. Okay, if you say so, but at least he did it, right? At least he did it. So, so there's the drought, but even in the drought, uh, we have to just keep on doing the work. And then also with that comes the doubt. Again, he said, I haven't told, I, I've been toiling all night. You can see a sense of doubt in his voice. It wasn't like, oh, Jesus said, cast my net. That means I'm going to catch something right now. No, in fact, look at uh, verse 5. Look at verse 5 here. Many of you probably already know this, but look at this. It says, Simon answered, said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down, what's the next two words? I will let down the net. Now, did Jesus say to cast out the net? No, he didn't. Let's back up a little bit. Look at verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down, what's the next two words? Your, which is plural, he didn't say, Peter, you know, let down, let down thy net. He said, let down your nets. He says, you better get ready, Peter, because you're about to catch a bunch of fish. <laughs> and Peter's like, I just don't know. I, I, we toiled all night. Okay. I, we, not only did we toil all night, but then we worked so hard to mend our nets and to get them clean. We throw them back out there again. We're just going to have to clean them again. But I tell you what, I'll throw out my net. And so he goes and he, and, he, and he throws out the net. And isn't that how we are sometimes? It's like, okay, God, I'll do a little bit of work, but I don't want to invest too much, right? I don't want to invest too much, but I'll do a little bit of work. Well, Jesus said this. You say, man, I've been working so hard. I know he's, he, there's a work he's called us to do, and I'm doing it, and I'm not seeing results, so I just don't know if I can trust God. Well, here's what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church. Amen. It's a promise. We just got to trust him that he's going to build his church. Matthew 16, 18, I say uh, also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
the gates of hell. I used to read that and think, well, I don't understand that verse because how do gates like, like fight you? The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I thought like, like the gates are the ones doing the, doing the action here. But you know, what it's really saying is we're going to bust the gates of hell wide open, Amen. right? We're not gonna we're not gonna let you know uh, let it have its uh, dominion, and we're gonna kick the door down. So so here's what he says, uh, uh, Matt. And I don't mean kick the door down because we're going to hell. I'm, <laughs> I'm talking about <laughs> I'm talking about we're gonna defeat it, okay? Amen. Through through the through God, right? He shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly, Amen. and so he's going to work through us to accomplish his work. He said he will uh, will build his church. If we're doing the work the way he commanded, it will produce fruit. And if it produces fruit, he's glorified. He said, herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. But what did he also say? He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, ye can do nothing. Amen. So we can't go out there and say, well, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to catch the fish. It doesn't work that way. You say, where do you want me to cast the net, Lord? And he says, cast over there. You're like, I've been fishing there for a long time. I don't think I'm going to catch anything over there. Nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. Well, yeah, I should have let down a bunch of nets because he's going to bless it. If he says go, go. Just be obedient and wait for him to bless it. Look at uh, Mark 9, 24. It's natural for us to begin to doubt God's plan. And, uh, you know, John, we won't take the time to look at Matthew 11, but we know that John uh, had his, his seasons of doubt. You know, here he is in jail. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God. You know, he's been, he's been preparing the way for, for Jesus. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sins of the world. Here he is. And that's not long before John the Baptist is in prison. Fixing to get his head cut off is what ends up happening. And while he's in prison, he's thinking, you know, things were going pretty well until Jesus showed up on the scene. And he says, Lord, he sends his disciples to go talk to Jesus. He says, are you really the Messiah or should I look for another? You know what that's called? Doubt. <laughs> he was doubting. <clears throat> Thomas doubted. John 20, 27 says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hands, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. He wants us to believe in him, just trust him that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. What did I say, Mark? Are you already there? Mark chapter 9, verse 24. <clears throat> this is a, a story where uh, Jesus is healing this child here. And Jesus uh, said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And you know, God's people said, Amen, right? If, if all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. I'm so glad he didn't stop there. Because the next part is the part that we all really, really need to hear. You know, I've knocked on doors before and somebody says, well, what if I don't believe enough? You ever heard that? No. Or, I, or I, in my daily life, think, man, if I'm a disciple of Christ, I'm saying I'm going to give my life to the Lord, I'm going I'm to do everything He wants me to do. And then I'm saying, well, I have my little seasons of doubt where I'm just not really trusting in faith like I should. Well, here's what the guy said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. <laughs> I believe, but not enough. I wish I had more faith. It's kind of like Peter. All right, I'll cast my net down, but I don't really feel like this is going to happen. Do it anyway. right? And he did it by faith. We have to uh, trust the Lord by faith. There's going to be seasons of doubt. After all, we're, we're in a drought. That's when we're going to have doubt. And I'm not trying to be a poet, but that's the case. Number three, though, is the draft. Look at verse 6 back in our text, Luke 5, verse 6. Luke 5, verse 6. And when they had done this, I'm sorry, and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake, 
And they beckoned unto their partners, which should have been out there with their nets, helping them to begin with, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him, in the draft of the fishes uh, which... Uh, which they had at the draft of fishes, which they had taken. And uh, so we see here the draft. Okay. Again, I don't completely understand the etymology of the word and everything. So bear with me. But what it means is a big catch. Okay. It's going to have a bunch of uh, fish and that's what he did. So here's the point I want to make on that is that when we are following the Lord, we might have been in a season of, 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 of a drought and things don't be, seem to be happening the way that we think they'd be happening. We, it might have caused us to have some doubts in our own selves and the doubts that we're doing what God called us to do. And is this ever going to work? Is this going to, is this going to happen? When we have those times, we need to just keep doing the work anyway. And, and here's what we need to do. We have to realize that eventually, if I keep doing the work God's called me to do, there is going to be a draft. Okay. I better be prepared to drop what I'm doing. Who cares if I'm cleaning all my nets and getting it all ready and mending them and making them all perfect. When he says throw the nets back out, we need to throw the nets back out. And we need to be expecting that big things and great things are going to happen. I'm not talking about name it and claim it, you know, where we just, we get to decide what it is that we want God to give us. Because in actuality, Usually when God blesses or he gives you a greater uh, job to do, in essence, that's what he's looking for, right? We're, we're always wanting blessings like, hey, just shower down all these luxuries on me. But that's not how he works. When he blesses us, it's with something that we can do more for him. He gives us more so that we can give more. And so a lot of times what we think is going to be the end result and the blessing is not the blessing at all. All right. So, so we really don't know how God's going to bless but, uh, but we need to be expecting that when the time comes and he does bless, it's going to be big. We don't want to just go out a little bit, throw out one net, you know, throw out. We want to be prepared for great things. All right. And I believe the Lord will do great things when we try to follow him and do his will. But if we're doing the work, we should be watching and waiting for whatever it is he's going to bring. And we need to uh, uh, expect that it's going to be big. Look at Luke chapter 6, next chapter, in verse 38. Jesus said this, Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom for... With the same measure that ye meet, with it shall be measured to you again. Now, we, we often use that in the term, in the, in the context of giving money. Give more money, and if you give more money, you know, God's going to allow you to be blessed with more money, right? That's what the charismatics like to, like to pick up on, right? But the idea is this. He's saying, look, the more you give by faith, uh, whatever it is you're given, all the work that you're doing by faith because God's asked you to do it, when you give that by faith, it's not like you're going to regret that. He's going to bless that effort. He's going to bless whatever it is that you sacrificed and whatever it is that you gave, He's going to bless that. Whether it's money or it's just time that you invest, hardships that you go through, struggles, you know, whatever they may be, He's going to bless all that if you are given. Look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 9. Matthew 25, verse 29. I might have said 9. I meant 29. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Can you imagine, you know, how much God could have blessed us with? We stand before God and the rewards are given to us and we're thinking, man, you know how much more 
I could have gotten from the Lord if I would have just invested more, if I would have just done more, you know, use the abilities that he's given me, or maybe just grow in some areas where I need to get some more training and I need to get better. If I would have grown in that, how much more he could have used me. I think about that all the time as a pastor. I'm like, man, I went to one college for, for four years. I wasn't in taking school the whole time. I'm not that dumb, okay? One college, four years. Another one for 10 years. I should be a doctor by now. <laughs> no, another one for 10 years. You know, I was in all these great independent fundamental Baptist churches who invested a lot in me. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, I had parents who kept me in church. You know, I knew to do my Bible reading. And I think back and think, man, what if I would have done more? What if I would have learned, you know, memorized scripture better? I, I, I stink at memorizing scripture. What if I would have worked at that and, 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 and made better efforts? What if I would have learned how to be a better soul winner early on? What if I would have applied myself there? How much more rewards, uh, how much more I would have got accomplished for the Lord, you know, and he would have blessed with great rewards in heaven. So here's a conclusion. Most of life will probably feel like a drought. Don't expect, you know, you get a couple bad days, like that's it, man, I'm giving up. That's ridiculous because most of your life is going to feel like a drought. Yep. Nothing's happening. I'm doing the labor and nothing's happening. I'm working, working, working. I'm tired. Uh, you know, things aren't going the way I'm I, I, I envisioned that they, would, they were going to go. Yeah, welcome to reality. Yep. That's just how the world goes. Most of your life is going to be, will feel like a drought. And even when you struggle with doubt because you don't see anything happening, keep letting down your nets, right? Just keep letting them down. When he says move, move. When he says uh, do this, you know, then do it. And when you do that, be ready for the draft, okay? Ready to receive more. And when you receive more, you're ready to give more, okay? And that's how we need to do uh, the Bible says this, Psalm, Psalm uh, 126, 6. Psalm 126, 6, most got it memorized, I'm sure, but here's how it says, uh, He that goeth forth and weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I like that word doubtless. It says, you go forward, you go forth weeping, bearing precious seed. Why the weeping? Right? Because it's effort. You know, in the ministry, it doesn't matter what aspect of the ministry you're in, there's going to be heartbreak. There's going to be sorrow. You know, people are going to let you down. Uh, there's going to, people are going to give you grief. There's going to be all kinds of things. Uh, people are going to reject the gospel. Doesn't that hurt? They don't like walking away from a door knowing that person's probably going to go to hell. Uh, you know, sometimes I, you feel like, man, I just, I just probably gave that person his last chance to receive Christ. You ever felt, felt that way when someone's like, yeah, I hear what you're saying. I, I think that's probably true, but I'm not going to get saved. And you're just, <laughs> what are you thinking? Right? Sometimes you do that. It's sorrowful. It makes you weep about it. I'm not talking about weeping for joy, right? <laughs> because you got somebody saved. I'm talking about sorrow. But you're going forth and you're toiling and you're doing the work diligently and you're bearing precious seed. It says, you shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. In the end, you're going to be happy because God's going to bless the effort that went into it. And so I want to just close with using the analogy that Jesus also used, not just fishing, but he used another one. A lot of times, if it wasn't fishing, he would talk about farming, right, or scattering seeds and, and, uh, and planting, okay? So here's what he says in Luke 8. I'll just read it to you. Luke 8, 4 through 8. And when much people were gathered together and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed... Some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit a hundredfold. 
And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And he goes on to explain what that is. And he says, the seed is the word of God. So when we go forth bearing precious seed, scattering precious seed, we know good and well that a lot of that's going to fall on, on thorny ground. A lot of that's going to fall on, on the hard ground or the, or the rocky soil or, or whatever. A lot of that seed is going to seem to be wasted, right? But we don't know. He didn't tell us that you need to strategically place that seed in the exact type of soil, get out your litmus test and check the pH balance of the soil and, and make sure you got the fertilizer and all that. He didn't say that. He said, scatter the seed. That's a job I've called you to do. Scatter the seed. Amen. Scatter the seed. Some of it's going to fall over there. You don't know what's going to happen. Some of it's going to be choked out. Some of it, birds are going to come snatch it away. We understand that's going to happen. But your job is... Is just to go forth and scatter some here and scatter some there and scatter some there. And God said, I will bless the increase of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us through the word that even when we toil and labor and sometimes feel like things aren't happening the way we envision them to happen, that we realize this is not our church. This is your church, Lord. This is not our work but this is the work of God. And we're not trying to bring glory to ourselves, but we're trying to glorify the Father uh, by bearing much fruit as we work in Christ and as we abide in the vine. Lord, I pray you bless the efforts of this work. Uh, bless your church as we seek to do your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.